Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. I feel good right now. Do you feel good? I feel good. I really do. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord is so good. You know, when I, uh, I look back and I think about what the Lord has been doing, and so the, the emails we get, the stories we get, meeting you folks. I had a great dinner last night. There was about 20 of them that met in the, lava, in the uh, restaurant of the hotel. And we just had dinner and had a great time. And they're some of the craziest people I ever met in my life. I mean, they thought we were all intoxicated. They don't realize that we were in the Holy Ghost. They said, how can these folks have so much joy? Because when you get filled with the Spirit of the Lord, it's love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 All right. Praise the Lord. Open your Bibles, if you will, to St. Mark's Gospel, if the Lord will bless us tonight. Praise the Lord. Daryl Maya, didn't he bring a word? Oh, my God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I mean, when he got done, if you, there's no other way but Jesus. Can you say amen? You know, in the Surah, it does say that they say that Jesus was not crucified, but another uh, a disciple took his place. And so they have all kinds of excuses to why they think Jesus is not the Messiah. And I think Daryl Maya did a wonderful job bringing out the fact that he absolutely is the Savior, the Messiah, that he's the Lamb of God. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is coming back. Let me tell you something. When he died on the cross, he was a lamb led to the slaughter. But when he comes back, he's not coming back to be weak, anemic, and laid upon a whipping post. He's coming back with his eyes the flame of fire, his hair as white as wool, his vestures dipped in blood. On his name is inscribed, faithful and true. He's coming with ten thousands of his saints. Can you say? shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's the king of kings and the lord of lords praise the lord now i was asked a question pastor begley will you mention the cern yes i will will you talk let me tell you something else jade helm comes to an end in two days thank god but what were they doing and we've been given different excuses but when they closed all these walmarts five of them in the same hour for plumbing issues. I said, hold on a minute. What in the world are you talking about? Five Walmarts closing at the simultaneous security guards, barbed wire fences around the parking lots. There's something don't add up. This is Walmart. The Lord said, and Heidi said to me, the Lord gave her a word and said that they kept talking about the plumbing. She said, the Lord specifically gave her a word and said, oh, the plumbing is the tunnels under the Walmarts connecting to other uh, distribution centers, if you will. And if you understand the, four, the 850 FEMA camps in this country, they all set on a railroad track, every one of them. And people will say, well, you guys are just conspiracy theorists. You guys are just, you know, it's those crazy Christians over there. But that's what, that's what they were thinking when Adolf Hitler was building his concentration camps in Germany. And as he built them, he started his propaganda of shunning the Jewish people. He preached his Nazism, which was from the pits of hell itself. He was literally the closest thing to the modern day Antichrist that we've ever had as he persecuted the very children of God trying to exterminate them and eliminate them and to do unto them, to destroy them. And here's why the devil was doing this, because Satan knows the word. He knows that if the children of Israel could, are able to uh, migrate into Israel, what you were preaching about, he knows that if they get established and Jerusalem is their capital, that when the king of glory comes, he's coming back to Jerusalem. Can you say amen? He knows this. Now, Israel had not been a nation for 1948 years. From the flood to Abraham is 1948 years. God made a covenant with Abraham. Exactly 1948 years, you can add it up. From Christ 
to Israel being rebirthed as a nation 1948 years because God made a covenant. Is it an accident? Was it a mistake? Or God have a perfect plan? Perfect plan. So when Daryl was talking about Israel becoming a nation in 1948 on May the 14th, and the fact that we just, and we were in Jerusalem actually on the 67th anniversary this year, and I was there that very day, we were there, and I was thinking about it. There's only three years left and it'll be 70 years. And the Bible talks about a generation being 70. And by reason of strength, 80 is the, uh, the life of a man, okay, if you're blessed. 120 is the maximum you can live. So I got thinking about it. I said, Lord, are you serious? I mean, we're almost at the 70 mark here. Are you counting from the rebirth of Israel? Or are you going to count from the reunification of Jerusalem in 1967? Well, even if that's the case, we're getting closer to that time. So I don't know exactly. And then people can debate that. And that's fine. But the, the bottom line is this. The Nazism of Adolf Hitler was to destroy God's people to try to prevent the coming of the Messiah. But he failed. Oh, he slaughtered six million of them. Oh, and by the way, he killed seven million Christians, not all by himself. Some of the others did as well. Every time that the Israeli people, the Jewish people, since, the, since Christ crucified and rose from the dead, every time there's been a genocide on the Jews, there's been a genocide on the Christians. Am I right, Dr. Rosa? So whenever these blood moons come around in which we're in, this is not something that somebody thought that's a pretty cool theory. What we're talking about is an actual prophetic time that we've never seen before and we will never see again. There is a man by the name of Gil Brazard who actually has studied the every time in the Bible that a great sign or event has happened. He traced back those events. I'm talking about when Hezekiah's sundial went back 10 degrees. With Jonah, the preaching of Jonah, and they repented. Whenever there was uh, uh, the different signs, uh, whenever oh, J Joshua's longest day, when the sun stayed up 24 hours, he went back, he actually went to Europe, and he went actually to China, and looked at the very records that they had on their uh, documents of things they've seen in the sky, and the dates they wrote down and what they saw. When you trace back those dates to the time of what happened in the Bible, they match. Amen. So in other words, the Lord said in the last days, there'll be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear of things coming upon the earth for the power of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall you see the son of man. <laughs> coming in the clouds of power brother Johnny in great glory yeah. when you begin to see these things come to pass he says look up lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh when this gospel is preached unto all the world and a witness unto all nations then shall the end come and when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whosoever readeth let him understand it in other words we are coming into the age of the antichrist we are actually in the age of the antichrist which means we're in the age of the coming of Jesus Christ I'm serious no nobody knows the day nor the hour no no we don't know it but we definitely know we're in the season I can Amen. tell you that I mean, when you see the, the, the leaves turning colors, you know it's fall. When you see the fig trees casting their figs, you know what time it is. We're living in this very prophetic time now. Hitler tried to destroy the plan of God. He went right after it. Now, you have to understand something. Adolf Hitler, when he was nine years old, he uh, lived in a little town in Austria. There was a museum there. And, and when he was nine years old, he went into the museum at four o'clock in the afternoon because it closed at five and you could get in free for the last hour. When he went in there, he walked through there, he came to a shadow box. And on the box was what's called the Spear of Loganus, or also known as the Spear of Destiny. This spear is believed to be the spear, they don't know for sure, but they believe it to be the spear that the Roman soldier used to pierce Christ in the side. Now, historically, this spear has been handed down to different conquerors, 
Constantine had it in his possession. Napoleon Bonaparte had it in his possession. Alexander the Great had it in his possession. So this was, and here's why they did, because it's what's called a chargeable object. It's a tangible object of evil. And that's the reason it survived and was passed around. You have to understand, when Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't just anybody. This was the man who said he was the son of the living God. The Bible, even Josephus, the great uh, historian, Jewish historian, said there had never been a man had ever walked through Jerusalem. He turned the city upside down. Whether he's the Messiah or not, he said, I don't know. But he turned the city upside down. Listen, when blind Bartimaeus was sitting by the wayside and he had heard that Jesus had already cured 10 lepers and he already heard about a woman who had an issue of blood who just touched the fringe on his prayer shawl and had been healed. Blind Bartimaeus said, Lord, have mercy on me. The son of David, help me. They told him to be quiet. Some of you have come to seek a blessing. Somebody might tell you to be quiet. You need to shout, just, you need to shout, 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 shout. Shout with the voice of triumph. Have mercy on me, thou son of David. Jesus stopped and said to him, Come, come to me. What wilt thou have me to do? And we tell you what he did. Can I take this off? Because it's hot here. You guys are here. Praise God. We're all family now, aren't we? Amen. Uh, amen. We're all family. So he took off his coat. Now listen, he was wearing a coat that was to be recognized. In Jerusalem, if you were a blind man, they put a certain coat on you. So when you sat by the street, when the people walked by, when they saw you wearing that coat, they didn't have to ask what your problem was. They already knew you were blind. It identified you as somebody hurting, somebody in trouble. So you were identified. The devil wants to put a coat on some of you. And he wants you to keep wearing it, that you're defeated, that you're, you're broken down, that you're never going to be blessed. Wants to keep you on the side of the road begging. Wants to keep you outside of the glory of God. Wants to keep you some way aware, away from God's great anointing. But whenever Jesus said, what wilt thou have me to do? It's because when he's called him forward, the man took his coat off and started towards it. But he was still blind. So it had to be faith. Why would you take off your blind coat while you're still blind? Because you're expecting to what? To see. If you came here tonight, praise the Lord. First of all, to hear about biblical prophecy and all that. I'm going to get to it. And, and all this. Yes, that's good. You need it. Information will give you revelation. Revelation may bring forth a manifestation. And if you mess around long enough, you might even get salvation. Come on, somebody. But whenever you get to the point that whatever's dragging you down, whatever's holding you, what is that tangible thing that you're hanging on to that is holding you back from the glory of God? I say, take it off and come to Jesus. He'll put on you a new coat. He'll put on a new robe of righteousness. You'll be blessed, blessed, blessed by the best. Praise God. My God, I feel good right now. Praise the Lord. Look out, devil. I feel like I could go 15 rounds with the devil right now but praise God I don't have to because Jesus knocked him out in the first round <laughs> am I right praise God praise the Lord amen I know these security guys have a problem with me because I never stay in one place just relax for example I was preaching in uh, I was preaching in Jamaica there was about 6,000 people there I didn't even know where they were at I got blessed and took a running spell I turned around and there were two security guards uh, gapping for air both of them out of breath I said praise the Lord you need me to lay hands on you they say no but if you don't stop we're gonna lay hands on you praise God <laughs> hallelujah give the Lord some praise for the security guards can you? my God so this Fear of destiny, this tangible object that different rulers had to try to conquer the world, but each time they failed. It wound up in this museum in Austria, and a young Adolf Hitler would go in and stare at it. And the next day he would get, get home from school, he'd run to the museum and go over there and stare at it. 
Then he started, when he got a little older, he started studying on what it was. He would run in there and he would stare at it. And at the age of 13, according to his own writings, he said he was there staring at it when something black and dark, a mist come out of it, he said it entered into him. He was 13 years old. He began then to study the occult. He got involved in satanic rituals and, and worship. He went completely to the dark side. Something entered into him that was not human. Something possessed a man who should have never been through this. Is he the first person to have ever experienced this before? No. Judas Iscariot, let's read what it says. Tonight I'm going to preach a message. Judas, you got your hand in the sop. Come on, somebody. You want to hear it? Praise the Lord. He's got it. I can tell you that. And praise the Lord. The Bible says in Mark, Mark chapter 14. I know we preach out of Mark 13 all the time, but let's go to Mark 14. Here's what the word of the Lord said in verse 10. And Judas, I'm in Mark 14, verse 10. And Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went unto the chief priest to, to betray him unto them. And when they had heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money and sought how he might conveniently betray him. It, some folks, it don't take much. They'll, they'll sell Jesus out for a root beer float. Some folks will say, I, I'm going to leave the Lord for the next adulterous fling. Come on, somebody. The reason 400, I, I'm shocked by that number. Are you serious? 400 pastors had signed up for Ashley Madison. And, and so if the shepherds are do, leading, if that's how the shepherds lead the sheep, they are all fall in the ditch together. Yeah. Now, now, look, your preacher, your pastor, he's not perfect. He or she, they're not perfect. And so don't expect them to walk on water because Pastor Begley sure can. I sink like a rock. I mean, that's how I sink too. And if you're expecting us to be, you know, always super spiritual, it's not true. We get headaches, backaches belly aches, all kinds of stuff. We're just glad we can call on the same Lord you call on. Amen. We're just normal people. Amen? Amen? Just normal. But one thing we can't be, we must have a higher standard. That doesn't give any of us excuse to pursue the things of the world, the sin of the world that would destroy us, destroy our families, destroy our marriages, destroy our children. And that cannot be the... Uh, leadership example of the church today sadly it is but not all so please don't throw everybody don't throw the baby out the bathwater they're not all off track can you say amen? amen and so praise matter of fact i think god's raising up an army i really do he's going to repeat he's raising up an army if he has to find you somewhere he'll dig it out he'll find people somewhere who will carry the gospel of jesus christ he will call them to preach the word and they will be blessed of God and they will be anointed and they will get the job done. And if the church rallies with them, it's unbelievable what God can do. But Judas was one of the 12, the Bible says, and when he heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. And the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sent forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go you into the city. There shall you meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house, the master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city, and they found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as he sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. You can imagine how they 
were stunned by this information. And they began to be sorrowful and say unto him one by one, is it I? Another one said, is it I? And he answered and said unto them, it is the one of the 12 that dippeth with me in the dish. It's the one that has his hand in the sop. Now I've always read that and thought, they couldn't they see it when it happened? But the Bible tells you that no, they didn't notice it. It was a, such a deceptive move. Now if you study the nations of the world, almost every nation, even though, and I'm gonna tell you right now, Israel is found, Israel was established by God. And America is the only other nation founded on the word of God. So that's why I never give up on America. It might get ugly, but winning ugly is okay. Okay, because we still can win. But every nation, especially in Europe and in the West, every nation that's founded, there are people, even our forefathers, were good, there were some great men of God who helped shape the Constitution of the United States. But you can know this, the Illuminati had its hand in the sun. Every, so you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But you can know from the very beginning of this nation, there were some among them whose whole purpose that they were involved in was to keep building secret societies underground with the sole intent to one day overthrow this nation. And they didn't care how long it would take. And they didn't matter if they lived to see it or not. The secret societies that operate in the darkness in the Skull and Bones, uh, in the Masons and some of the other organizations, the Bilderberg Group, the Bohemian Grove, some of the other, the other secret societies, absolutely there are certain individuals who are working feverishly to get in political position to in one day help take this nation down and to make a new world order or a one world government. I'm telling you, Judas has his hand in the sop. Yes. And he's at every table. He's, he, he shows up at every situation, every parliament, every uh, Congress, every nation. There's a few. Even Jesus knew this. When he chose 12, he said, and one of you is a devil. So Jesus even knew it was coming. But he wasn't afraid to choose him anyway. Because he knew he was going to win. And so even though we can see some of our very society falling apart, we can see the sin, we can see the corruption in the Supreme Court, we have watched them, how many abominations are they going to pass that have not been passed as law? And how often will the American people say, well, that was the Supreme Court ruling, we just got to live with it. I think we've lived with it long enough. Amen. I'm not, I don't feel like living with the devil, do you? And I think at some point in time, we have to understand and recognize that Lucifer has his hand in the sop. He has his hand in the dish. He's trying to derail Christ, but he cannot get it done. And the body of Christ, whether you believe it or not, also the devil has, the Bible says that when you, Paul said, I went to do good, evil was always present. All right. Me and you might miss a church service. The devil has not missed one yet. He always shows up. He's the first one to come, sometimes the last one to leave. And then some church, there was a janitor that spoke up and said, now hold it, I'm not the devil. <laughs> but seriously, the Satan is always trying to work his way in. He's not content though to sit on the sideline forever. He wants to work his way to the top. He wants to get in position to control the people. And so in these last days, what you're going to see is a constant push Right now, we're seeing a push like we've never seen before. So Adolf Hitler had the spear of Loganus, or the spear of destiny. And as he began to attack and take on the, and conquer the nations in Europe during World War II, and as he was doing this, he was already systematically arresting the Jews, stripping them of their wealth, taking away their citizenship, shaming them, to putting them on uh, uh, rail cars like cattle uh, and leading them to the death furnaces, the death camps of Nazi Germany. And the world sat back and knew it was happening and nobody did anything. Can somebody say amen? amen. 
And so as it went on, nobody wanted to get involved, just like what's happening right now with ISIS in the Middle East, killing the Christians every day. Nobody wants to get involved. Whenever Daryl tells you we get death threats, we do get death threats. And when we get them mostly from those who are trying to protect the Islamic faith, who get very angry and attack us because we're calling out their sin. We're calling it, we're not trying to hurt them, we're trying to get them saved. But at the same time, we have to ex expose the fact that they're trying to destroy our brothers and sisters, trying to destroy the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand that it's going to happen as we read to you this morning in Matthew 24. But even though I know the devil's a wolf, doesn't mean I wanna run with him. I am always looking for a way to conquer him through the power of Jesus Christ. I have to, I have to, you, every one of us have to do this. You have to stand up against the obstacles that try to stop you. There are some of you right in this building that are called according to the purpose of the Lord and the devil's trying to kill your vision while it's in the conception stage. He always wants to kill the seed. He told Jesus even, I mean, God told Lucifer in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. Now we know a woman doesn't have seed, except Mary, when she gave birth to Jesus Christ, she conceived of the Holy Ghost. So, but anyway, what the devil's tried to do is kill your vision at its conception. He knows if you get a foothold, if you birth this, some of you are, uh, uh, some, oh, some, it's touching me right now. Somebody here is actually, there's something God has put on your heart. Maybe two years ago, maybe three years ago. Maybe you've almost give up on the vision, but something in you is birthing. I hope tonight that you give birth to this vision. The devil would try to kill this vision in the womb. Amen. Destroy your hope of ever accomplishing what God has called you to do. And every person, it's a different situation, but whatever that thing is that God is doing in your life, I want you to not be afraid. And yes, when the moment you declare it and start to move forward, there will be opposition, there will be unbelievers, there will be people, and a lot of them will be in your own family, and there will be folks that you used to run with who will say, oh my, he, he, she's lost her mind. There was a woman at Fort Lauderdale, we did a conference at Fort Lauderdale, and she sat on the front row. She was from Haiti. She was homeless. She would bounce from shelter, and every now and then she'd get an apartment, then she'd wind up out of there and back in the, She had pancreatic cancer. She's sitting on the front row, and she came to the conference, and she said, I just need some Bibles to hand out to people on the street. I want to witness to the people on the street. Now, here's a woman, anyone knows if you have pancreatic cancer, it's not a good, it's not a good thing. And I said, okay, we'll give you some Bibles and you take those Bibles out on the street in Fort Lauderdale and you help lead people to Jesus. But I got a word from the Lord. You were sitting there. Remember her? And uh, the, the Lord, and I said, God's going to heal you today. I feel God's going to heal you. The Lord said to me, she needs a healing because she's got a vision and she's already running with it. And the devil wants to kill her before she gets any further. So she was one of the people we prayed for that night. And many that were. And she left there. We gave her a bunch of Bibles. She went on. We went home. We got a letter in the mail about a month later. I need more Bibles. She wasn't dead. <laughs> Pastor, I need more Bibles. I got more people. People are getting saved out here. I, need... I said, all right. So we sent her more Bibles. Another month went by. We got a letter in the mail. Said, Pastor, I'm out of Bibles. I need more Bibles. Do you got any tracks? I said, we wrote her back. I think Heidi, you actually got her on the phone, didn't you? Heidi finally got her on the phone somehow. She had a pay phone we could call. And Heidi asked her, said, how are you doing? Because we're worried about her health. Oh, she said, I forgot to tell you, I got healed of that. That, guy, that cancer's gone. That's why I need the Bibles. She got 
God healed a pancreatic cancer, but she was more in, 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 more involved, more concerned about give me some more Bibles so I can get people saved. You know what I said? We're going to go ahead and pay for her to go to Bible college online. I know a pastor for $400 a year. I said, we're going to pay that $400. This ministry is for, I'm going to invest in this woman because any woman that can come from Haiti and be healed of pancreatic cancer while giving out Bibles. I want to bless that individual because I believe she's going to bear fruit, fruit. Fruit, do you say amen? amen? See, I think we're living in a time today that even though Lucifer has his hand in the sop, even though Judas has his hand in the dish, you still can't stop the plan of God. Has, has the devil been messing with your life? He'll get right in there and mess with you. At communion, Jesus is at communion. This is the Last Supper. He's getting ready to go to the cross for the sins of the world. And the devil's got his hand in the bowl with him. And yet, it didn't stop him. He even looked at him and said, whatever you're gonna do, do it now. <laughs> and the Bible says, and the, the devil or Satan entered into him. And the Bible calls Judas the son of perdition. Now he's the only person in the Bible that was ever called the son of perdition or the son of hell. Except there's one more. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about the son of perdition. The wicked one, the lawless one. Who will rise up in the last day, the Antichrist himself. So to become the son of perdition, Lucifer has to enter into him. And that individual is going to be somewhere close to the, to the table with his hand in the sob. So the Antichrist is just not going to crawl out of somewhere and out of left field and all of a sudden, wow, this guy must be him. No, he's going to be someone who's been working his way to position of power. And he's trying to take a position to where he can rule the world. And Perry Stone says, I believe that he's already alive and I believe he's already working and is working toward that position. And I got to believe, I think Perry Stone's right. He says, uh, Perry Stone says, I'm, I'm telling you, he's alive. And he's getting close. So I can't help but watch sometimes some of the world leaders. And I watch what they say and watch what they do. And you'll notice there's a deception sometimes and you start to watch it and say, well, you know, I don't know. This could be, maybe not. But, but you will see Antichrist spirit controlling several individuals. They may not be the son of perdition, but they are being controlled by an Antichrist spirit. And how, what do they do is they will start to fight the Christians. If you find someone who does nothing but fight Christians, you're watching an individual who literally is being led by an antichrist spirit. Now, Paul, John said there are many antichrists that went into the world. So it's not just, you know, and they all will work for the same goal. And that's to stop the gospel of Christ. Now, Russ Dizdar, who does a great job on demon possession, will tell you that he calls what he calls the black awakening is because the Bible, which I'm going to get into, tells you that the bottomless pit will open and out of the bottomless pit will come Apollyon and Abaddon, the angel of the bottomless pit, with keys of hell. And he will loose upon the earth the demon spirits. And those demons will go forth to do his bidding. And the first thing they're going to do is attack the church. They will fight the church. Because the church is the most powerful thing on this planet, whether you know it or not. I know sometimes we feel like we're getting beat up and like we're losing ground. But trust me, we're the strongest force there is. Can you say amen? Because when two of you would agree touching any one thing, it shall be done. One can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Behold, I'll make you conquerors, more than conquerors through Christ that strengthens you. He says when you put on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Gird your loins with truth. Have on the, oh, praise God, oh, praise God. Have the 
sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and the shield of faith that fights off all the fiery darts of the wicked. If God be for you, thank you. So, again, Adolf Hitler said, I got the spear. I'm going to do what none of the others could do. I'm not only going to conquer the world, but I'm going to kill the Jews while I'm at it. And I will ruin this. I'm telling you, he was trying to stop the, the plan of God. Now, thank God for the allied forces. Thank God for praying grandmothers like my grandmother, who was back in the hollers of Kentucky during this time praying. And she said that they would get out and pray. And some of them said that there was a time around 10 o'clock in the morning because they had big families and after the mothers had already got all the family fed and the kids up and everybody out of the house and the dads out working somewhere, that the, grand, that the mothers and the grandmothers would go out onto their porches and start praying around 10 o'clock. And they would pray. And all of a sudden you could hear them praying over here and over there. And it would start to ring against the mountainsides of West Virginia. In the mountainsides of Kentucky and Tennessee. Amen. And they could hear them praying, God, deliver our children. God, bring our boys home. God, defeat this evil that's rose up. In the name of Jesus, God, we know you're going to do it. And they would pray and they would pray. And let me tell you something. There are people that can testify that, we, that God got them out of situations that were impossible. But with God, all things are possible to them that believe. I mean, it's time to not be afraid of the devil. It's time to take him headlong. It's time to go at him. It's time to go on the offensive. For too long, the body of Christ has been on the defense. For too long, we've said, well, there's no use trying this. The devil told me, you're crazy. You think you're going to go to Dallas, Texas? You've never even been to Dallas, Texas. You have never preached in Dallas, Texas. You've never set up. You don't have any churches to work with in Dallas. How in the world are you going to go to Dallas, Texas and expect people to show up? The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, go to Dallas, Texas. And I will send them. And when they come, Feed them the word of life. Feed them the word of the Lord. Feed them the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And watch and see what will happen because of this convention. It's not maybe what you see now. It's what is getting ready to happen. <laughs> I mean, one thing, if I had to come, I couldn't have heard all this good singing. And I couldn't have heard the message your brother just preached or my wife just preached earlier. I couldn't even got to meet some of you, got a hug from some of you. I'd have never known who you were with the face that I see in the chat room. But now that we've become more acquainted, look out because you are now, I'm going, oh, praise the Lord. Because when you, when you pray in the spirit, people's faces start coming to you. I've been praying in your chat room names coming to you, but now I've got a more intimate relationship with you. And that means, look out, you're in trouble. Okay? Well, God's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. He's got a plan for you. I can tell you, I can tell you right now, oh my, can I prophesy? Can I prophesy? My, my, my. This young man right here, stand up, Matt. Right there. That man's called to preach. Right now. But it's more than just preaching. No, 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 you don't understand. How old are you? 25. 25, Lord have mercy. If I was 25 again, you wouldn't be able to stand me. Praise God. He's 25. God's going to do something with this young man. Going to raise up something mightily. I, I'm prophesying it to you now. I'm prophesying it to you just like the Lester Summerall prophesied to me. I'm telling you now, may the... Oh my God, can I lay hands on him right now? Praise God. Glory, glory. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just lay our hands on this young man. Oh, God, just fill him with the power of the Holy Ghost. Direct his steps in the right direction. Lead him deeper into the Word of God. Let him step out, Father, by faith. Not too far ahead and not too far behind. But God, raise him up here in Texas. God, you can do it. I've seen you do it, Lord. Use him. Keep him humble. He's a soldier for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And everybody said, Amen. And amen. And amen. Great parents. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. 
y'all know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I know it when I feel it. Dr. Rosa, you know what I'm talking about. When God gives you a word for somebody, there's another man right there. A praise the Lord, hallelujah. He's got a spirit on him, a humble spirit on oh mine. A praise the Lord. This is a good man. You folks know him, anybody know him? Praise the Lord, what's your name? David Carter, lift your hands in the name of Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint him with power. Anoint him with the anointing. Let him walk forward. God, you've given him a humble spirit, but it's mighty. And Satan, I, I, I put you on nerve, a notice, devil. You've got problems here. As God used this man, and praise the Lord. Bless him going in. Bless him going out. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. 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 Huh? I rarely ever do that. I mean, rarely ever do that. Praise the Lord. But sometimes you get a word from the Lord. Sometimes you get a word. When the Lord gives you a word, praise God, run with it. The enemy may come against you like a flood, but the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. And when the enemy comes against you one way, he'll send your enemies fleeing seven different directions. But praise the Lord. You've got the power in the name of Jesus. You've got the power in Jesus' name. You've got the power in the name of the Lord. Let somebody praise him. It's time to shout now. You better get ready, 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 get ready. Because I'm telling you now, God wants to stir up that gift that's in you by the power of the Holy Ghost. My Lord, sit down. I'm not done. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, shout now. <laughs> Joshua said, shout now. Praise God. But the walls ain't fell. I said, shout now. Hey, get in. Get in. Get in. Get in. Hey, get in. God said to Gideon, I've got you to, there's an army of Midianites. There's a hundred thousand Midianite army. I want you to take them down. And Gideon said, all right. And so he called everybody and he only had 32,000. He said, Lord, there's only 32,000. They got a hundred thousand. And he said, Lord, what we're going to do? God said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. Tell everybody that's afraid to go home. Yeah. 22,000 went home, left him 10,000 left. Now he's outnumbered 10 to 1. He said, God, what am I going to do? God said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. Take them down to the brook and let them lap and let them drink. And I'll show you the very ones that have the faith and are humble enough and are, are willing to listen. See, a lot of folks want to go gun ho but they're not willing to submit. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Everybody ready to go to battle, but not everybody ready to submit. You've got to humble yourself. Don't think you're going to tear up the world. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to find your place in God. And it's going to... The Lord loves a meek and quiet spirit. He likes those that hear the small, still voice. But if you'll wait on the Lord, if you'll wait on your ministry, if you'll wait on the Lord, He will lift you up in due time. If you humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, He will exalt you in due time. Can you say amen? You got too many, Gideon. Gideon went down to the river. They began to wash them as they drank. And he said, oh, Lord, there's one there and one there. And oh, Lord, there's a couple. Oh, good. 300. 300, Gideon. Now you're ready for battle. 300, Gideon. 100,000 Midianites, which if you listen to L.A. Marzulli, he'll tell you they were, the Midianites also were hybrids and there were giants among them. Okay? Sometimes when you take on the devil, you got little devils, but sometimes there's big devils. But you still got the authority in Jesus' name. He said, Behold, I give you power to tread over serpents and scorpions, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall harm you. Nevertheless, rejoice not because the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your name is written down in glory. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so he says, Here you go, Gideon. This is your army, 300. They're ready. They're not afraid. They're humble. They're ready. They'll do anything you tell them to do. So tell them to leave their weapons at home. 
because they can't beat 100,000 people, but I can, because I am God. I am that I am. I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. Gideon, lay your weapons down and pick up a pitcher of, of light. Have a, a torch in one hand and a trumpet in the other. And tell them, divide them into 100. Put 100 on this hill, 100 on that hill, and 100 on that hill. How about this? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Get them ready. Get them ready. Tell them to have a light in one hand and a trumpet in the other. Praise the Lord. In other words, the only way you're going to beat some of those devils you're facing is simply praise in the Lord. The Bible says the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. The reason they've always said in the, 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 the Old Testament, the Jews would always send out the holy singers first. Why? Because it set the stage. It brought the power. It brought the presence so that you could go to war with the word of God. You got 300. This is the battle plan. Gideon says, all right. No need a sword anyway. We're outnumbered so bad. We're going to have to totally trust in God. That's exactly what God wants you to do. And so they put him on the three hills. When the time come, Gideon said, break the pitchers and shout. Blow the trumpets and shout. We come against you in the name of the Lord and Gideon. Shout now even though you haven't won. But yes, you have won because you did exactly what the Lord told you to do. Amen. The battle's not mine. David said it belongs to the Lord. <laughs> so what we have to realize that in these last days, the early church, we can study in the book of Acts, we see that the early church was very powerful, extremely. They went from house to house, breaking bread with prayer and supplication. When they would preach, people would get saved, 3,000 here, 5,000 there, a bunch over here. Get, the Bible says they were adding, to God was adding to the church daily, such as should be saved. I get emails in the mail from people who will say, Pastor Begley, I don't understand it. You're telling me people get saved on Facebook. You're saying they get saved on Twitter. Now we got one saved the other day on Periscope. First time we had that happen. They get saved on YouTube. They get saved in live broadcasting. Get saved on television. Uh, the first television broadcast we ever did, three minutes after it went off the air, a man from Houston, Texas called me and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Three minutes. It took three minutes. Every type of social media that you use, God will save people. Everything you put your hand to, it shall prosper. Do you still believe it? You, the Bible says, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law he doth meditate day and night. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He shall not move. His leaves will not wither. And whatever he puts his hand to, brother, you know it, David, he shall prosper. David, I don't know much. I was on your radio show one time, and I asked him today when I saw him. He's from uh, what part of Florida? Uh, the, the village is Ocala. The, the village of Ocala, okay. And, and, and he had me on his radio show, and we'd had a great time. And so I asked, I asked him, I said, can I come on your show again? And he said, yeah, we can come on your show again. And I said, because I want to, because I feel something there. I feel, you know what I'm saying? Do you ever, you ever get a connection with somebody? Immediately you know it's somebody you want to work with. Because I, I call it a kindred spirit. Amen. Amen. And, uh, but the, I, after you said yes to me, then later, I got thinking, the Lord came to me during lunch. And he came to me and said, hey, you need to talk to David G again. David, David G, excuse me. You need to talk to David G again. Because the man is about ready to be blessed. Uh -oh. And you need to talk to him about it. I have no idea. I don't even know. Is there people here that own business? Is there anybody here that owns a business? Stand up. Would you stand up? You own a business. Just stand up. You own a business? You own a business? Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Praise God. Praise God. Can somebody lift the hands of them? God bless your sister. Let's bless them right now in Jesus' name because we need entrepreneurs of the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray a special anointing and blessing upon them. God, bless them with the power of your word. Anoint them. Bless open doors that have not opened before. 
Pour them out, Lord, the opportunity to prosper and be in health even as their soul prospers. That the kingdom of God may increase mightily. Use them, Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. And the people said, amen, amen and amen. And give the Lord some praise. Accept that by faith. Accept it by faith. There was a little boy they brought to our church a few years ago. He had a tumor on the side of his head, about the size of a softball. He came in on a Sunday night service. Never met these people in my life. The father, the grandfather, I should say, was an atheist who would go in his barn because his wife would listen to me on the radio on Sunday mornings in the house. So he'd go to the barn on Sunday mornings till that 30-minute show was over. I bet he's going, he'd be going crazy now. I understand there's people that's going, what, what, are you serious? You got kids doing it. You got some bird in Australia that goes, what, are you serious? <laughs> so, I mean, that didn't drive him nuts now, but he's out in the barn, but his granddaughter gets a tumor the size of a, about a softball size on the side of her head. They took this child to Riley's Children's Hospital, one of the best in the world. They uh, did chemotherapy, radiation, did everything, instead of it getting better, it got worse, it was getting bigger. His wife, though, was born again. And finally, what she did was this. She said, why don't we take this child to God? Amen. Of course, he didn't believe in God. But even an unbeliever might start to look around when somebody, something they love is in trouble. Can you say amen? When what you're doing, if, what's, if the things you're doing aren't making any sense, you might need to change some things. And so what they agreed to do was to bring this child to one of our Sunday night services where I was pastoring at the time. It was back in 1997 or 8. And they brought this child in. When they came in, they came in and we were praising the Lord. And anyway, I walked over and shook their hands. And, and they said, we come, the, our, our granddaughter is very ill. We come for prayer. I said, bring her up right now. Come on, come on. We're going to all pray. We're going to anoint them with oil and pray. So they brought the little girl up. I got the oil on my hands. I went to lay my hands on this little child, and the little child was afraid of me, wouldn't let me touch her. And I said, oh, Lord. And the Lord said, put your oil on the grandfather and let him put his hands on the child. Now, this is a man that don't believe. But I didn't know he didn't believe. So I put, I said, here, put your hands out. She's afraid of me. I just put the oil on it before he knew what happened. Before he, sometimes some people need to get the anointing before they know what hit them. Hallelujah. Let's put the oil on him and say, here, now you lay your hands on her and I'll pray and God's going to heal her, okay? And he says, and he looks at me like, okay. <laughs> but when something is this desperate, Amen. you might, re, might actually take a desperate chance. Right. He put his hands on her and we prayed. And then when they were done, they took their seat and we went on with the service and they left. And I never seen him again for six weeks. Never heard from him again. Never seen him again. Six weeks later on a Sunday night, here they come again, the whole family, brought more with them. They came in and when they walked in, it didn't take me three seconds. I looked at this little girl and that softball tumor on the side of her head was gone. Gone. <laughs> Heidi knows. You know what the devil told me? Well, she's had surgery and they've got rid of it. That's what the devil told me. He immediately wanted to steal the victory from Jesus. Yep. But, but we asked them what happened and they said, we don't know. We just went back and it started shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And we've just come from Riley's hospital yesterday and they did a PET scan and she is cancer free. Come somebody shout. And guess what happened? I gave an altar call. Guess who came to the altar? Give his life to Jesus Christ. You're right. That all anointing grandfather who said he didn't believe. But when miracles start to break out in the church, people will start to believe. Can you say amen? Can you say amen, brother? Praise God. So Adolf Hitler had the spear of destiny. Plotting to destroy the Jews and the world. But the prayers of God's people brought the allied forces and as they weathered the beaches of Omaha and the beaches of Normandy and 
blood was spilled on the sand. They overtook the Germans. When the General Rommel heard that the Americans had broken, breached the front line, and was on the inside, Rommel said these words, we are defeated. I'm not gonna go tell Hitler, because he'll kill me, but we're done. And Rommel took a pistol and blew his own brains out, because he knew it was over. And he knew the atrocities, and he knew the murders, and he knew the death camps, and he knew what would happen to him by the world standards. He knew it was over. And so he was like Judas Iscariot. He hung himself. And so when he shot himself and died, and as the Americans and the, and, and the British and all of the Allied forces began to move in toward Berlin, then here was Adolf Hitler clutching still his spear of destiny. He had put his hand in the sop. He had sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. He had betrayed the word of God. He had fought against God's people. He was literally possessed with the devil himself. And when it came time, he ended his own life before he was taken out. When the, when the army, the soldiers got in there, they began to go through the bunker he was in, finding, trying to find papers, trying to find anything they could find that they could use. And while they were in the bunker, there was a young soldier who saw a block in the wall that had some mortar missing. And it didn't look right. And he started to mess with it and it came loose. And when he pulled this block out of the wall, there was a, something laying in there. He pulled it out and looked at it and said, this looks ancient, this looks like an artifact. This is, what is this? And he took it to his commanding officers. They didn't know. So they handed it up to the next one. He didn't know, but it was awful old. And when they finally got to a general by the name of George Patton, anybody hear him? Yeah. Patton said, oh, I know what that is. That's the spear of destiny. And he started to tell them about Napoleon and about Constantine, Alexander the Great. He said, these guys believe whoever has this spear has the power to conquer the world. And I didn't know Hitler had it, but he ain't got it no more. And so they, the United States of America kept possession of this spear for about 40 years before they put it back in the same museum in Austria where it's at today. So, and I want to tell you now, Satan will use any type of ob object, uh, what they call chargeable objects, something that is, that's what Satanists do, that's what they do. They, they use different items to try to, you know, gain more power. Not only Satanists, but the voodoo, voodoo does it, all the different occult practices use objects. And they like to use the blood of babies. And you know what they're doing now? The uh, ISIS is selling little bottles of Christian's blood to Saudi Arabians for $100,000 so the Saudi Arabians can wash their hands in the Christian's blood because they believe that gives them full remission of sin. This is, this is the evil that we're dealing with in the world. Yet we will. We shall overcome. Amen. We will. Lucifer has his hand in the sob. Lucifer is trying to destroy, but he cannot get it done. He knows his days are almost over. He knows the time is it's short. He's working triple time. He, if you wonder why he fights you, it's because he, he knows how close it is. He wants to stop the work of God. He wants to stop you from believing and dreaming in what God's put in your spirit. He wants to keep you from having total victory. He's a liar and the father thereof. He's the accuser of the brethren. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Now turn your Bible to 2 Thessalonians just for a couple more minutes. And let me just read just a couple more minutes. And uh, it says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now we beseech you, brethren, by the, and he just read this earlier. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, listen to this, because they, they say we're doom and gloom preachers. So let me tell you what Paul wrote, okay? Let me read it to you as Paul wrote it. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not so soon shaken in mind. Get over your nervous purpose. Jesus is coming soon. All right, don't be shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by the letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Can you say amen? amen. Oh my, praise God. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And he will be revealed. So don't be nervous. Don't have fear. For the Lord hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Don't be shook up by this letter that I'm writing to you. Because I'm telling you, the day of the Lord is at hand. Get yourself ready. He's coming. The son of perdition's about ready to stick his head up. And he's already had it crushed one time at Calvary. And I'm telling you, he's not going to win. And it says so. He, the son of perdition will be revealed. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Or that is worship so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God he said remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time he's gonna walk into the temple of God before the worshipers of God and say that he's God this is the abomination of desolation that Daniel saw in Daniel 9, 27. This is what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 24, 15. And Paul tells you what it is when the Antichrist is revealed in the temple in Jerusalem. When he walks in and says, I am God. And you can know this. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not scared of it. I could care less what the devil thinks he's going to do about it because I know we've got the victory in Jesus' name. Now, I'm going back. I'm actually going to Jerusalem in about two or three weeks, and I'm going to be doing nine television shows from Jerusalem. I'll be filming there. One of the two of the shows will be I'm interviewing Rabbi Yehuda Glick. And we know Rabbi Yehuda Glick was shot four times last October by a radical Islamic Muslim who said, Allah Akbar, as he was standing one foot from him and shot four bullets into his chest and said, you're an enemy of Allah. And so Yehuda Glick, who is the leader who's trying to get the Jews the right to pray on the Temple Mount, he is the one leading the charge. He's one of the founders of the Temple Institute. He is the one that's saying, we must build the temple. So he gets four bullets in him point blank but as he was in the hospital he was in a coma for 30 days and he was in the hospital he said God came to me and whispered to me and said Yehuda I love you and he survived he was in the hospital for a while when he got out he said he finally opened up his laptop he said it's I'm ready now to read what they wrote about my assassination attempt he opened his laptop typed in Yehuda Glick assassination and Google, guess whose name came up first? Woo! Hey, praise God. Yeah. So he clicked on it and said, who's this guy? And then all of a sudden I'm saying, breaking news, breaking news. Yehuda Glick has just been nearly assassinated. We don't know if he's going to live or not. This has just happened. And I'm calling on all my brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for this man. Because this man has a specific role that God is using for him. He's trying to build a temple. And he's trying to do this, but it's actually biblical prophecy. And you know what? Pray for him. So I call on the church to pray for a Jewish rabbi. And then I ask the Jews to pray for him also. In the video. Well, I didn't think nothing about it. But he did. When he watched the video... He told his wife, who is this guy? I want to meet him. Why would a Christian pastor in America care about me? And so he contacted us through Heidi's Facebook page. And when I met him, he was a very humble man. And we had a, a great conversation. He drinks coffee. I think he could out drink me in coffee. I mean, he just kept pouring and pouring it. So I was getting ready to interview him for YouTube, and you could watch it. It's a four-part interview on YouTube. But before we did the interview, we talked off the record. Can I share one thing with you? He said off the record. And we talked about the temple. And I said, you do know what the Bible says in our New Testament about the temple. Who's going to walk in? He goes, oh, yeah, I know. The Antichrist. I know. 
I know your New Testament. I know Revelation, he said. And I was scratching my head, really? They know because they know. They know we're real, folks, trust me. They know they have a friend in the Christians. Can you say amen? amen. They know it. And they're curious, very curious. And so we talked off, off the record, but I'm gonna throw one thing that we said. I said, let me ask you a question. If the political environment was to be just right, how long would it take you to build the temple? How long, if you guys actually got the word, if everybody signed off on the UN, Pope even agreed. I mean, what, 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 how long does it take? He said, we can build the temple in six months. We already have it prefabbed. It's in storage. And I'd already been to the Temple Institute, so I already saw the golden shoe bread table. I already saw the golden menorah. I already looked at the seven trumpets on the, on the wall. I looked at the priestly garment that the priests will wear with the breastplate with all 12 stones. It took them 11 years to find the one missing gem, but they found it. I already seen the, I looked, they got it. I said, okay, six months. He goes, six months, it's done. I go, well, but you don't have everything, right? I mean, you don't have everything, right? Oh, he said, we got everything. I said, no, 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 you don't have everything, right? Oh, we have everything. So if you think that they're not prepared, even the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Perry Stone had talked to a rabbi a few years ago who he asked him, he said, Rabbi, I need to know, is the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia in that little temple? Is the Ark of the Covenant at Golgotha where Ron White said he saw it? Or is, where's the, is the Ark of the Covenant lost? Tell me, do you really know where the Ark of the Covenant is? And that rabbi told him that it was in a secret compartment in a tunnel under Mount Moriah. They have it. And they were getting prepared. And I, I was asking the Lord about this. I said, Lord, why would this, I mean, the temple, I could care less. It doesn't matter if they build the temple for me. How about you? It really, it doesn't really matter to me. But I know it's going to happen. So I'm not going to fight it because it's in the Word. And so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, okay, it's going to be built. And the devil, the Antichrist will walk in. But I know this temple is not being built for the Antichrist. He said, oh, no. Every church that's ever built, is it built for the devil? But he shows up. The temple is being built for the glory of God. And people will come from all over the world to see it. And there will be a revival in Jerusalem. And remember, Paul, read Revelation chapter 11. For John's seen in a vision and has the blueprints to build the temple of the Lord. And he says there'll be no outer court. And I've seen the blueprints. Uh, Benjamin and Yahoo even showed them. It has, it's a, a miniature of Solomon's temple, but there's no outer court. And if you read Revelation, it tells you because that's for the Gentiles. So here's what you who neglect tells me. We're going to, the Muslims are going to have their mosque. We're going to have the temple. The tourists can go in between. People are going to come from all over the world to see the glory of the Lord. And then he says to me, did you ever read in the Torah? Yeah, I've read the Torah. We, well, by the way, so you'll know Yehuda, us Christians, we read the Old Testament too. <laughs> he says, okay, well, did you ever read Genesis chapter two, verse 10? For the gold in the land is good. I said, uh, I don't quite, yeah, let's go. But here's the question. It's the creation. The Bible says the gold in the land is good. He said, I was praying. I said, Lord, it came to me, what gold? Because Solomon, when he built the temple, did not get gold from Israel. He had copper mines. He traded it for gold. He got the cedar uh, trees from Lebanon. So the gold in the land is good. And Yehuda says, he asked the Lord, what gold? What gold is good? And the Lord said, go to Mount Elat, for there is gold. So Yehuda Glick goes to the, uh, the government of Israel gets the mineral rights to Mount Elat, goes and hires, what do they call those guys? Not Geologist. seismologists. Geologist. Cardiologist. <laughs> Geologist. And those guys, and they went over there and they started testing the ground. And when they tested the ground, they said, uh-oh, are you serious? They hit a vein of pure gold worth somewhere between one and ten billion dollars. The land, the gold in the land is good. But why did it take 6,000 years?
years before it was discovered. And why was it discovered by a man who was shot and almost dead? Because he was trying to build it. And why in the world did he call me? I don't know. But they're going to build the temple of the Lord. I promise you that. And here's what's going to happen. It will be a glorious thing. It will be powerful. But you can know this. There will be an Antichrist and he will walk in. And the three and a half year period will come. The 42 months the Gentiles will run through the city of Jerusalem. You can read it in Zechariah chapter 12. It says that Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling and a burden of stone unto all people. All that burden themselves with it will be crushed into powder or, or broken into pieces. But it also says that the Lord seeketh to destroy all nations that come against Israel. And then it, and that's in, in uh, Zechariah 12, 9. But it also says, and in that day, the Lord will pour out the spirit of supplication of grace upon the children of Israel. They're going to see the king. They're going to understand who the Messiah is. And I started reading. I said, Lord, how are they going to understand? He said, because I'm going to send my two witnesses, Paul. Go back to Revelation 11. When after they build the temple, he says, then I'll send my two witnesses and they will preach in the streets of Jerusalem. And God will reveal. Yeshua is the great and the great and the great Lamb of God. Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. Yeshua, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Now you can shout now. 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 I'm going to have Kevin come on. Come on. Praise the Lord. I want you to get on your feet a moment. I'm going to tell you something right now. There are people here today. The devil's told you there's nothing to Bible prophecy. The Bible says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Lord said, preach the end times and use it as an evangelistic message that people will come to Jesus and be saved and be healed and be delivered in the power of God. I'm going to ask Daryl Mine if you come stand right out here with us. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise. Somebody start praying. Somebody start praying. Somebody start praying. Oh, hallelujah. Let me say, every person that's being baptized tomorrow, would you come forward right now? Come forward right now. Come forward right now. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Come on, come on, come on. Every person, maybe you're standing there right now and you're saying, I never said I was going to, but the Holy Ghost is saying, yes, you're going to. Why don't you step out right now, right now, right now. Step out right now in Jesus' name. That's the way. Step out right now. It's time to put on the whole armor of God. It's time to come out now. It's time to step forward. It's time to receive the powerful blessings of God. There's others. There's others. There's others. There's others. There's others in Jesus name and I'm going to ask Kevin to sing and as they're here if you're here tonight and you're not saved and you heard that Jesus is coming soon and yes the water is turning blood red and the birds are falling out of the sky and there's wars and rumors of wars just like Jesus said it would be in Matthew 24 and there's oh there was two volcanoes today in Mexico erupted today I didn't even know that if you're here and you want to be saved, why don't you come forward right now as they sing, come forward right now, right now. Johnny and Linda, would you guys come forward right now? Help us right here. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Come on right now. Step out. Step out. Step out right now. Just say, uh, Pastor, maybe you've been, listen, maybe you're here and you're saying, I, I know I'm not saved, but, but. I figured I had more time. Listen, we don't know the day nor the hour the Lord's coming. I have no idea, but I know he's coming soon. The Lord told me to watch and pray. For an hour you think not, the Son of Man will come. He's coming like a thief in the night in the which the heavens are going to roll back. The Bible tells us it's going to melt with a fervent heat. The Bible says every eye will behold him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you're here and you want to be saved, why don't you step out right now as they sing, as they sing. Come on. Come on. Sing it, my brother. Praise the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Church, pray just a moment. 
Somebody hurt me bad. Five or six of you, eight or ten of you. I'd do that tonight. I'd do that tonight. I'd do it right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Open your hands and thank the Lord for these three coming right now. That's a way. That's a way. Hallelujah. There's others. There's others. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I see the blood. Sing it, brother. Gives me my salvation. How many others? That's a way, that's a way. Praise God. That's a way. Give the Lord some praise, somebody, as they're coming. Give the Lord some praise as they're coming. Watching on the internet, type I want to be saved right and now. The blood in the chat room, type I want to be saved. Hallelujah. Still Do it now. Do it now. How many others? How many more? That's the way. Praise God. Give the Lord some praise. Come on. Two more. Come on. Come on. Praise God. salvation I wonder right now 
How many are here? You're saved. But the devil's beat you up. He's trying to steal your joy. Somebody's here tonight. That you're hungry and you're thirsty for the joy of the Lord. You're hungry and thirsty for the joy of the Lord. Jesus, Why don't you come down as well? Because we're going to pray for you. Come on, that's a way. Come on, come on. That's a way. That's a way. You need your joy restored. David said, Lord, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. That's a way. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody praise the Lord. Somebody praise the Lord. Somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
you pray along with me? Our Heavenly Father, I come to you earnestly. I'm walking by faith. I come forward tonight that I might receive. I come here today to be saved. I come here today to be restored. I come here today to acknowledge my water baptism. I come here today to be filled with the joy of the Lord. I come here today to be healed of all diseases. I receive my healing. I receive my salvation. I receive the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Ghost. The joy of the Lord, which is my strength. I'm seeking the anointing. For we know, Lord, the anointing, it breaks the yoke. I come to you, I repent of my sins, and I confess them to God, and I claim my blessing. I believe in my faith. I receive in my faith. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, just bless me. Let the tears flow, Lord. Help me, God. I want to be stronger. I want to be ready. I want to know your plan for my life. Right now. Right here. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. I am saved. I am healed. I am filled with the joy of the Lord. Now somebody give the Lord some praise. Some of them are here, but are showing up there. But we just praise the Lord. Amen. Is that right? Amen. We're just happy. Yeah. We're going to uh, 
praise the Lord for all of these folks here. I'm going to have Johnny pray with all of you. Johnny and Linda will pray with all of you in a moment. And then uh, we've got the rest of the evening. You can stay as long as you want. we got to be out of here by 10. But what I'd like to do, stand out by the door in a moment, because this is one thing the Lord told me to do. When I was preaching to crowds of 11 people, he told me, when you preach, and I don't care where you go or no matter whatever happens in life, stand by the door, shake hands with people when they leave. I don't care if it's a coliseum, stand by the door, shake hands with people as they leave. We're going to do that. Daryl, you'll do that with me, won't you? Praise God. How many love Daryl and Maya and his wife? people's face over there. That is the smile of being born again. got the coffee cups. <laughs> what? Are you serious? He's got his CDs, his DVDs over there, folks. If you have, if you enjoy his music, get, get a copy of that with you. I've got some stuff over there, my books. But look, I don't want to take any of that stuff home with me. I don't. Reduce the price, do something, but I don't want to carry it on Southwest Airlines. It's too heavy. All right, so praise the Lord. All right. You and me? All right, I'll have him do that. We're going to bow our heads in prayer. I'm going to go back to the door. And folks, you can just, we can, we can hug each other. We can take pictures. You can do whatever you want to do. Fellowship with one another. It's been a great, how many's enjoyed this? Do you want us to come back to Dallas? About Fort Worth. About Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Did that work? Fort Worth. How about Houston? How about Houston? That's not bad. Houston? Okay. Now let me share this with you. I am, I've already booked the uh, Civic Center in West Monroe, Louisiana, March, what Heidi? March 12th in West Monroe, Louisiana. And that's not that far for you folks from Texas, is it? So how many think they just, just off the top of your head saying, you know, I just might do that. See that? So you think about this, and you're not gonna believe this. Don't tell nobody. But we've invited one of the Duck Dynasty people if they'd like to come and give their testimony. They haven't said whether they're going to do it or not. They said they're going to get back to us. They, they're sure they can get us at least one family member. I asked for Willie. I said, oh, we'll take uh, the older man. What's his name? Yeah. Phil. But I said, you got to send me Cy. I'll even take Cy. Okay. But no, they, they seriously will get back to us. So keep praying about that. It'd be great if one of them came, wouldn't it? To help us out in that. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask Pastor Scott to come forward right now and going to let him dismiss this conference and to pray over it and to bless each and every one of you. Praise the Lord, Pastor. Thank you so much. Let's go before the Lord, shall we? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you, Father, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit over each and every person here. We thank you, Father, that we will carry the anointing of the Holy Spirit home with us. And that we will pour from one vessel to another in Jesus' holy name. And by the power of the Almighty God, Father, we will go forth with your name. We will go forth as apostles to your, to your one and only Son, the only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will go forth with your word. Father, let it be so and let it be done in the name of Jesus Christ and by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Um, I'm here from Austin, Texas. Yeah, awesome. Up, yeah, we came up to come to the Bible Prophecy Con uh, Conference and uh, it was a wonderful experience. I think God really worked uh, people just uh, giving their life to Christ and just the information that we shared was just so important. 
uh, especially relevant to this time that we're in right now. We know that God is actually doing something amazing. Uh, there's a huge prophetic movement going on right now. And I know the Lord is about to reveal that to so many people in these last days. And I just thank uh, Pastor Bacon and I think uh, Daryl Myers and stuff as well. Uh, all the information is wonderful. Just thank you for the sharing with us here in Texas. It's been an amazing experience. Okay. Absolutely blessed by the conference. It's truly, all the speakers were just wonderful. The word was just wonderful. I was really touched. I was healed tonight. I hadn't been able to lift this arm for over six months. Uh, and just to praise God. Praise the Lord. My name is Brittany O'Day Wilkinson. I'm known in chat wing as Outdoorsy. And um, I've come from East Texas. It's just, I mean, two and a half hours away or so. But um, I drove all the way here to see Pastor Paul and Heidi, and it's been wonderful, a wonderful time with the Lord. I, I really felt the Holy Ghost pouring out in there, and I just I got so emotional, and it was just wonderful. I've never had uh, been to a Bible prophecy thing before, and it's just been a huge blessing. A wonderful. This is all you. Uh, we're from San Antonio, Texas, and uh, I was just telling Pastor Bigley about two years ago, I was looking, uh, stumbling through the, uh, the internet, and then I, I found it was okay, because I'm a home health nurse, and I like to listen to you know, a, a pastor preach, because I normally hear uh, John Hagee back in San Antonio, but he's not on the radio all the time. So I saw him, and he kept saying, are you serious? I said, okay. So I started listening to him and I noticed that he had a broadcast time from 12 to 3, but it's at until 11 to 2. He said, okay, I'll start listening to him and I was just look. And then I didn't realize that his wife, uh, Heidi, had a, a show on Thursday nights and it's basically, you know, for free for, for, for the children. And uh, I watch her too. It's uh, real enjoyable since she's uh, a home health nurse and she stays in the faith all day long. All day long. And I can't get enough of him. And I can't get enough of Heidi. And sometimes I'll miss because I gotta see my patients, but I always go back and check on my iPhone. I, I, I love it. It's the best thing that's ever happened. Yes. Go. Um, this is Kathy in Texas. And I'm Mary from Texas. We're sisters and we came here to the Paul Bagley Conference and we just loved it. It was wonderful, amazing. Yes. I'm from Fort Worth and she's from I came from north of Houston. And this is Mom. Mom. <laughs> Mom. She never goes in the chat room, but she's always listening. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lee Lily. Um, the conference was just awesome. Kathy Deering is in the background making faces at me. <laughs> but we had a really, really good time, and you just don't know what you missed. It was powerful. So maybe the next time you can come when he comes to Fort Worth, hopefully. So, all right. Are you serious? We're serious. I'm seriously <laughs> serious. What? <laughs> it was great. We seriously got anointed. Yes. Got a prayer cloth and prayer it was cloth. Wonderful. Healing. Felt the Holy Spirit. Kevin Wilson was, was awesome. It was great. <laughs> Two Kevin Wilson CDs. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, and I'm being baptized tomorrow. Woo -hoo! <laughs> Hold that moment. <laughs>